so very, very happy to have uh, you come and meet with us this morning. A special uh, welcome to the Saudi Arabian delegation that is here today. Because today is an important day. It's an important day for Saudi Aramco, and it's an important day for uh, Prince Mohammed University. Um, when we're talking about technology, th this morning we are very, very fortunate to have Dr. Nair uh, with us. But before we get on to that, I want to tell you a little bit about our, our um, uh, guest speaker. You know, technology, uh, when this university was started, it was started with the idea of having the latest technology and the best technology that's available. And I think back on this, this was six years ago, and I see the changes that have taken place. The things that we thought were so new and so wonderful back six years ago are obsolete. Things that we thought were wonderful even last year we find are obsolete. And it, it, it's almost at that point over here where things are moving so fast that we are not, uh, we just have to try to keep up as best as we can. Now, Saudi Aramco, I think, is the example of uh, uh, achievement. It's the example of where we want to see things going because you're constantly looking ahead. You're looking at the future. And today, our guest speaker is going to be talking about where we have come from in technology and where we're going. But let me tell you a little bit of uh, background about uh, Dr. Nair. He's a visionary technologist, contributed extensively in education, advanced research, and a administration throughout his career. He looks forward to implement trend-setting thoughts, practices, and innovations in education, research, and social systems. He's had 32 years of experience in professional fields spread over education, research, and industry. He holds degrees in uh, Masters of Technology, a PhD in Computer Science. He was the Vice President of one of the largest education centers, the DS Institutions in Bangalore, India, um, and the founding director of RHC Bangalore, a leading research house recognized by the government of India. He has had so many years of experience. He has uh, been involved in so many things. Later, he concentrated on education and contributed extensively in academic fields for the last 14 years in India and abroad, educating and leading research in the field of science and technology, especially in computer science and engineering, as well as multidisciplinary domains. He authored and published about 130 research papers. I wonder how many of us have done, got anywhere near that. 130 research papers in computing and multidisciplinary fields, and he promotes cross-domain fusion of knowledge. He is the chief editor of journals Inter-JRI uh, Science and Technology and Inter-JRI Computer Science and Networking, published by Interland Publishers. He is a senior member of the IEEE for the last two decades and a member of various other societies like ACM in the USA. His articles on current thoughts and lectures on education, technology, and business are published by leading Indian publications. He has acted as the chair of many international conferences, including the Euro-Indian Research Conference. He has been called to lecture in so many different countries. He is an international speaker. He is an international researcher. He is a person, I am, I'm just so thrilled that we have him over here uh, to work uh, as our first uh, position, uh, endowed chair uh, position for technology and information management. I don't want to take up, up much more time because we've come to listen to him. And so this morning, he will be taking us back to where we have come. going to look like. He is one of the leading, leading, uh, I, I want to say the leading thought people <laughs> in terms of where technology may be taking us. Thank you, Dr. Nair. We'd like to have you invite you to the chair now. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. 
and uh, now I find ladies are not there, would have been uh, fine in the technology progress what we make in the world. So, my dear colleagues, the distinguished guests from Aramco, and uh, some of the other people whom I find, uh, probably I'll be spending much more time with you at that time I will be able to speak on a personal basis. Well, today my mission is actually to make a presentation to you all about the, the technology, the computer and information technology, a perspective towards the 21st century, a creative transformation. Well, we have a great legacy. We have a legacy of about 50 years we were actually developing the science and engineering of the computing. Well, we are the, we are all the product of it. Many of you might have seen the Valve computers and many of you might have seen the biggies of the 70s where I used to play with a deck of cards of this much and get a small result like this. And you have seen the semiconductor revolution taking place from the LSIs to VLSIs to super VLS SIs by which today we are able to fabricate of the order of a billion gates actually over the wafer. So there's a sweep of technology as far as the hardware is concerned and there's a sweep of technology which was taking place in the 20th century second half after the major inventions which has taken place in 1950 at the middle of the century. Well, what, ha what was actually the, the direct impact of it? The intellectual domain of the, the society, the perception of the society, the way in which the information handled by the society, everything changed. That's how you are today. When you are touching on the tablet, enormous amount of transformation of technology which has taken, in past, taken place in the past has been embedded into that. Well, many of us are actually dealing with the computers strongly, deeply. At the same time, prospectively when we are looking, we will be getting what sort of impact it made on the society and what sort of intellectual transformation it has added to us. Well, so to say, the, the knowledge, what made us to evolve over a period of the whole year saying, in fact, when I'm looking into the evolution, 432 million years of the first vibration of the molecule, adenosine triphosphate under the ultraviolet, which triggered actually the, the way in which probably the species are today to say to say, there was actually an information gathering and information processing taking place in the molecules. So looking at that stage and then coming back to our civilization for the last maybe thousand years and the way in which we try to encode the information and the try to extract the information, the try to use the information in our daily life, it has got an enormous explosion for the last 50 years. And you know, before this time, probably before 20 years, I would say the knowledge was mostly actually the head bowed. Your professors, wherever you studied, or the professors of today or the past, they held the knowledge for us, they tried to transfer to us. But the revolution, what is taking place today, it makes things different. Knowledge is no more the head bound, it has become the network bound. The ways and means of dealing it, the, 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 the pattern with which we deal the knowledge, the whole thing is changing. Some of my latest work in the knowledge, information to knowledge transformation, which one of the patented things which I am showing later, the infolet system, that has recently, of the order of two weeks back, it was able to create two tensors of the knowledge, and both knowledge interacted and produced the splinters of n number of knowledge back. And when we filtered, we got, surprisingly, we got knowledge which is fresh, like if you are interacting with one of the young person or a kid for that matter, a child, 
teach them many things and then they will synthesize many of the things what is taught to them and they produce a new knowledge. It can be sometimes really inconsistent. It can be sometimes irrational, we agree. But the rationality filter the mother and father put to the child and child keeps on generating and he filters out, his system becomes ready and he thinks correctly. This is what is learning. So what I'm telling is the machines are becoming powerful and the systems are becoming powerful and the sweep goes on. So this is what I was trying to tell. The connected machines, the machines became more and more powerful by having billion, billion transistors getting integrated into the process which we will have a look. And the software is getting multiple layers and building like a largest onion on the earth. And then it is carrying out several types of functions which will be managing definitely the connectivity, will be managing the human interfaces with them, will be managing the environment with them and managing the creativity of the machine and so many things it will be managing and the whole thing is going on expanding. You will have a machine with you which has actually a subset of this. It is purposefully built and it will behave in a particular way to you. So looking at it, we find that there were machines evolving, they were independent and they got connected actually. The connected machines made the network and network made the internet and the internet connected the human being across the world at low cost, high speed, pumping knowledge. What was the purpose of all this? Why do you want it actually? We wanted it because we wanted the maximum connectivity of the information between the people. And we tried our best in the last few centuries to connect between us. We created books, we created various other media by which you know, we will be able to communicate. We go there and talk to them or we keep them close to us and then communicate. We write and send to them. So this process is a part of the evolution. So we are not sure whether the network of today is the final word in that. The way in which we can encode and transfer can be an implantation to at the later stage. Whatever is required for that, it could be implanted into the species using the biological networks what we can create. And that will be keeping the information what could be derived in the species probably. So this is actually the natural step what we got. The knowledge is becoming network bound, no more head bound as I said. Information at fingertip is the facet of the century today, not for tomorrow. Well, it was a race after 1970 which I was trying to tell. Having got a grip over the semiconductor, how to fabricate a single transistor over this semiconductor onwards to multiple transfers, transistors in thousands, millions and billions we have reached. We have got several types of architecture for creating the central processing units and the memory and the storage systems all enabled us to integrate the information processing units. And then we came to the, the CPU fabrication side, we have a breakthrough and then we came up with the largest CPUs until 2004 or 2005. We switched over to the multi-core designs and today we have on the wafer about a, a quad processor or a, any multiple processor. I know 80 core processors are getting designed and getting tested and it is in the field also for trial from Intel from Bangalore where my friends are working. So not only that, you can have 128, you can have 256 core, but the problem is how to deal with it which we will be looking into. So the revolution of processors went on in a large scale. This we're all adding actually. Let's have a look at the architecture and then try to contemplate what we have to do in the 21st century. So anyway, for the people who are actually in the, in the uh, hardware side, we have the von Neumann architecture and then we have the hardware architecture, we have the cellular architecture to deal with the parallel programming side and where we dealt with the instruction and the memory together and we got into the bottleneck, we isolated the memory and the instruction set in the memory side itself, tried to access separately, we have the hardware and modified hardware architectures, we have the pipeline systems and a variety of design. So CPU memory storage, amazing advancement we have made. Today getting a few gigabytes of memory right over a small chip, it's not a big deal. But I remember I working in 1980, making the first computer with the 64K dynamic RAM and ESL80, the ESL80 from the Scilog. 
where later I integrated the video controller to that, which has made the smallest computer. Probably I was not in a good race with, uh, um, with Microsoft or even for IBM. So the product has not come out, but still the papers are there and the idea. I, I used the digital research CPM 80. Probably those people little uh, working, little uh, uh, maybe historically in the background, they, they, they can recollect CPM 80, how it was. And when um, Microsoft came up with a deal with PC, um, for the PC with uh, IBM in 1980, digital research as CPM went into the dustbin. All right, so we require the silicon processing. Actually, today, when we are looking into, we are able to generate more and more CPU into the wafer. The question remains there. There is an architecture which naturally the human intelligence invented in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Collecting the instructions into the little more deeply we will look and then leave it there. I'm not here with equations and then diagrams of the complexity of the processing. But looking at the philosophy of it, we have actually a set of instructions, getting the instruction into the instruction decoder and the state logic works and the sequence of functions taking place or the operation takes place, you get a result. So seeking the instructions inside and decoding it and executing it, this is the way naturally a human being can think. This is the issue for the 21st century. And you have made large scale computing with 8-bit, 16-bit and 32-bit, 64-bit, 128-bit. If you want, you can go for 256 and 512 also. But you have not changed from the primitive levels of thinking that a complex problem can be sequentialized and the states of the machine which is running in temporal mode in the time domain, you can overlay it on the memory or in any sequence for that matter. A total results you are able to bring because you are doing one after another. So this is the only solution we had or this is the right approach we had in the middle of the 20th century. Today, when we are looking at it, the best computing systems of the nature, you take the brain what you have or anybody else have, for that matter, you can take the Einstein's brain then. So when you're looking at the brain, whether it is from a firefly where extensive research we do, last week I was one of the best biomedical research centers of UK. When we look into the mice brain, so what a wonderful work it is doing. Is the computing structure available or could be possibly available to the humanity only in the instruction decoding way? This is one of the fundamental questions we are asking. Is it instruction driven or is it function driven, the computing? You could create the functions because of the sequential processing and then arraying it into definite targets. But can it be learned the functions and accumulation of functions? Can a program be written rather than the way in which the people are struggling in the world to create? You know, the IT companies, IT outsourcing companies, they employ 200,000, 400,000 people to meet the demand of the world to create the software. They struggle over a period of one year, two years to create the largest system and go through the software development life cycle and then get it installed and then see to that all the defects are removed and working perfectly to the requirement levels. There is a process which has been rigorously created. It's absolutely a process driven, rigorous process driven. So on one side, we have established and we are actually proud of it. I am a part of it, I am proud of it. At the same time, we want to see for the 21st century whether the building of extra large scale intelligence, should it go with the architecture what we have today? Decoding, the, taking the instruction and then, and then trying to decode it at the micro level. Or will you be able to have learned the functions getting ready and a package of functions creates a program or a job or an execution which will bring the ultimate results what you want. So will you be able to list your requirements or your system a collection, a bundle of the functions, and the functions are known to the computer, and it executes much faster than any other computer can do. The way in which you think and find out, one of your classmates who studied with you, maybe in the first standard, 
if, you're, if you are trying to recollect how fast you are doing. If I want to do with my supercomputer for the, all the people I met till now until my age 50, and then I want to search in that through my supercomputing structure, whether it is a, using the iris or the face structure or whatever it is, if I am trying to do with that, it will take days and days and days, but the way in which you are going to actually harming on it and then taking it out, it's amazingly good. It's actually a functional computing and then how far we can go. This is one of the questions we are looking. We, we look forward to the, a change taking place in the world and the breakthroughs coming up so that, you know, the CPU designs what we have like this today and which is actually costing in millions, actually. Every time I redesign, every time I redesign, this is mainly for re redesign purpose to show the quantum of work and the quantum of money, what it goes into this this is not capable of learning from stage to stage. Of course, to some extent, we have created the IPs and reintegration we are doing. But anything what we change, it gets into actually uh, the uh, instruction structures and then the microprogramming, high level synthesis, real time circuit rate testing, and the circuits for cache, logic, synthesizer, timing analysis, floor plan, signal integrity, all together they up to the chip manufacturing from the very beginning of the order of 100, 100 engineers working with an overhead of about $250,000 I spend on them. They work for about three to four years. It, it comes to about $100 million to make one CPU. So the point is that when we are integrating this much of creativity into that, there is no means today to infuse the creativity into the computer which is monitoring me or 100 engineers who are doing this work. Same trouble exists in the software development too. Actually a process always becomes successful when the process is actually over the resource. Process and resource, they are working in a complementary pattern. But in the case of software development today, what's happening is if I develop a software with a system of computers there, the computer never learns anything from me. Next time, if I'm coming and then trying to develop another set of software, there is no contribution other than maybe a little bit of library, what I am getting, which is actually, we are still in the 1980s and 1990s modes of thinking. We want to put more cognition into that. That is the topic which I am bringing. So the question here is, can we change the architecture of the processor? Can the processor can be made a, a functional form? Of course, we are trying with NVIDIA chips and GPUs and things like that. But still, it has not hit the point. Will I be able to get my whole operation, what I want to do with the computer, will be writing the way in which I think, and then feed to that, it understands very fast. It distributes or a form of functional processors, FEU. And I never know how these processors are working but they realign the things and a modified form of parallel computing or parallel processing systems what we have, but they are functionally learned to understand what I'm telling, like calling a, a person, an expert in a professional field, I'm telling, I would like to get this whole thing actually designed or even with, let's go to the minimum thing. I would like to get this painted. I do not know the painting. I do not know how to select the colors and he knows so my interaction with him will be over the knowledge basis. And I list the functions. The functions are executed because the process, what he, he uses, knows the functions. So similarly, my whole requirement of using the computer will be cracked down in the knowledge domain. And a cognitive transfer of the knowledge will be given to the computer. And computer does it with such functional processes or the functional forms, which is actually distributed. Well, it could be a transformation of the current brain knowledge what we have, we have actually, we are studying and we are able to recreate. Well, we require the silicon processing at the time, I'm not forgetting. We want to reprocess the silicon into a much better way so that these sort of things we can achieve in the 21st century. In computer science part of it, the major part of the computer science is actually triggered by the software development. It's not only that, it's not software alone, but my major concern for the 21st century is the amount of work people have to do. I, I had a prelude sentence before that. 
massive amount of people are working to create the software systems. This was the case in our evolution. This was the case when we wanted to make a big pyramid. 10,000 people working for about four to five years created. And big blocks of, big blocks of stone they pulled actually. There is a pyramid algorithm itself. To pull a particular, particular block, I will be having ropes connected to it. Each rope, we, we wanted to have the management. Five people can hold the, five people can hold one rope. That means four ropes are there, two to each. That means about uh, four into five, 20 people are assigned for that lock to be moved there. Okay, you cannot add more people to that work. Why? Because only four ropes are there. And per rope I have actually already programmed. Only four people can, or five people can hold it. So, that way there is an assignment coming in the cloud. Anyway, that's not the point here. The point here is the massive labor gone into the primitive work what we do. So today, the software development, its generation, testing, and uh, its installation, and then further, further establishing it to work perfectly. Work perfectly requires large amount of people participation. We are ready to do the work, but when we create something, we want to transfer those powers to the computer or the machines. This is what exactly happened in the construction field. Today, you know. 10,000 people were required for making that pyramid means today actually one by thousands of it plus the machines can create it within that time. One by thousand of the human power can create that time. Since it is across about 2,000 or 3,000 years of span we are talking, we are able to detect it. There is a human energy or a human effort replacement which has taken place in this field of construction. But the same thing we want to push forward in the field of software generation too. We would like to interact with the systems in an intelligent way. We would like to have a consultative paradigm for the computers or the network of computers or the systems which we deal with. We want to transfer the creativity what we generate from time to time to them so that it can develop and it can inherit and try to know and then do better the next day when we come. Let's have a look at it. So the scenario is not different. I'm talking about the pyramid labor. So today we have to have 200,000 people working on uh, many of the companies across the world. All the service companies are actually highly populated companies. I'm not telling that you should not populate, but the labor what they do from morning eight o'clock to evening eight o'clock, it is very intensive and it's an intellectual exercise. You may not be able to see the physical exertion, but the way in which they strain their mind, for one time straining is good, but I want adaptive learning techniques applied in the computing systems by which what I do, the machine learns. What it learns, it repeats for me. So how do we achieve this? Transfer the creativity to machines, make them learning, let them grow, the, grow along with us, and today, this is not happening. Today, it is static. It's not able to. And if I'm putting more software into that, it will do that much. But how can we transform this? Actually, we require more intelligent, more autonomic systems in software development, and better models of software measurement and feedback measurement and feedback, interactive corrections and performance approvals, and then cognitive platforms. What I mean to say, if you want to develop the software, you will sit with the machines, and a consultative paradigm will come. The requirements I know, I can make the requirements to be known to the system. System will be able to go to autonomic design formats, and these design formats have measurement and control feedback systems by which it will indicate if you want to know. It can talk to you about the reusability of that. It can be in a capable way to talk about the defect products. And it can be the maintainability of it, it can speak to you. And if you want better reusability, tell that, I am disapproving this design. I want better reusability. I want a reusability of 0.7, or maybe at 0.8 level. 
which may be the limiting factor of it, but how do we know? How does the system know that when you are actually interactively developing a software with the system, how does it know that this maintainability is this much? You can give to the software engineer by the side of you and ask him to review it, he will say, this is the way the maintainability is. So he has got a cognitive capability and he has got the knowledge base to evaluate it. We want to transfer both his procedure, his knowledge back into the machine and the machine interacts with the development work what you do and it is able to predict. Probably some of my papers on the defect proneness, this December issue of the Elsevier software and systems, you can see the estimation of the defect proneness in the feedback loop during the design time. So the indicator will come. This is the defect proneness of this particular design. So the point is that more cognitive properties into the computer and make them learn what we are doing and then keep the knowledge extracted from us and then build it over that so that next time when I come, when I discuss the matter of the, probably the requirement of my system and it understands in a much better way, present the things back to me. It's a consultative paradigm rather than I am struggling and then doing compilation and then creating the codes. I want to transfer the creativity to the computers. Computers learn along with us. This is one of the major bottleneck what we see in the CMMI capability maturity model which is actually absolutely process driven system. Yeah, absolutely process bound and the rigorousness is so much we tend to forget the resource actually sitting in front of these. Probably we have got certain production metrics by which the people metrics are there. Some of them are good enough some of them are not at all. Some of them are so simple, it insensitively measures things and it does not give a process rigorousness, uh, repeatability. So we are looking into how the systems can become more intelligent and autonomic and then learn from us and what they learn they practice next time when we go to them. So the requirement to design translation, design to code translation and then automated inspection and testing against the specifications, it need to come up. Some of them are coming up. There is a set of people working and we have got one or two, three. And I have got one of the patent also in the uh, reusability, maintainability and defect proneness system by polynomial estimations. You make the design, the computer will give you the feedback. So the development of platforms and networks must do the major work of creating the software. Human being works to approve or disapprove we are not talking about we keep our eyes closed and say that I want a system for inventory control. Suddenly it makes and gives you. No, it, it is not that what we mean. We mean heavy, hard labor going into the production of the software to be reduced by creative incorporation of the cognitive capabilities or a little bit of psychological type of capabilities into the system by which it it creates parameters and metrics by which it is capable of evaluating, it is capable of giving the feedback to us and give a consultative paradigm to us so that we can approve this design, we can disapprove this design or we can tell that this is the way I want the improvement. So an age of intelligence has to revolutionize software engineering field. Today software engineering field is systematic, it is rigorous. So we want to add layers of intelligence around it by which it learns and still make use of some of the things what already we have achieved. And well, as far as computing is concerned, we cannot live without the communication. And we have made tremendous progress in the communication, you know that. The way in which you sit here, you can take your tab and then look into the things what you have. The question is, is that the end of it? What does it all indicate and where do we have to go? And the tremendous amount of effort required actually and the way in which we are doing the switching and routing and things like that, large trunking of the transportation of data taking place across the continent today, they, they are under real challenge today. The more I want, the more challenge it, it is producing. But the common man is enjoying maybe a 3G or 4G level actually connectivity what he gets out of the RF but at the same time there are communication domain which is actually under peril. 
many of the connectivities and the stress and strain of switching it and trunking it across. It is actually highly manual oriented and the decision making. So we are looking forward to a real network which is actually more cognitive and becoming more and more intelligent. Where does the intelligence stand? The intelligence is going to be at end to end at every stage we want to put. We have learned from the communication what, are, what sort of principles are required, what sort of switching is required, what sort of routing is required. Many of them we have tried to put embedded into the routers or the gateways and things like that. But still, overall decision making and the ambient awareness systems are not existing. Those things are actually given to the communication engineers and communication managers. And many of the time, today it's okay, but tomorrow it is not going to be okay. Why do you say that tomorrow it's not going to be okay? That's a fundamental question. I have got about six billion people across the world. And the transformation of the world is actually towards parity. Maximum entropy will build in any system. That's a fact. And that is correct for the world also. The people who are denied the information today, they will be able to get the information tomorrow. And six billion people end-to-end -end connectivity. Mr. A in XYZ coordinate of the globe to Z man in another coordinate, maybe in the southern hemisphere. He will be connected like this. Is that the only connectivity? Six billion people in six billion factorial transport, uh, the, the combinations I will be able to connect. This is the evolution where we are going to. By 2010, we may, might not have achieved, but we would like to achieve it in this century itself. Over a period of few decades, we would like to. So, we cannot govern the information transport by ourselves. It needs to be automatic, or we would like to say it needs to be autonomous. So, we want to see that end-to-end -end connectivity and end-to-end -end service capabilities based on much better intelligence in the communication side. And the machines tend to be pervasive. It is already pervasive with those privileged. The unprivileged they don't have still. So as knowledge works to spread, knowledge has got a tendency to spread. That's how we all got educated. The best people of the world, they give the knowledge free. Maybe there is a structure for return on investment, ROE, a little bit. But the tendency of the human being, not only human being, the whole species, they share the knowledge, the better they share the knowledge, the better they survive. Most of the systems who survived on earth, they shared the knowledge. Even the lions share their knowledge how to catch the prey. So the tendency of the knowledge is to spread more and more, and we are exhibiting the best way possible, the human being. So the more and more that tendency works out, the more and more demand for the communication between the intelligent systems. A computer communication is one part of it. The systems are becoming more intelligent and intelligence by itself will be driving more and more spreading of it actually. Every human being needs thousand times more processing capability because when the society evolves, many of the things are going to be under questionable conditions including the environment, the energy security, the food security, and uh, the transportation security, all these things are going to be over a period of, not tomorrow, over a period of few decades. Definitely energy security is going to be a challenge. And we may not be able to get the transportation the way in which we are getting today. We may have alternate schemes, but the time it's going to take. But we will have enough bandwidth by which the proximity of the people whom we want to talk to, whom we want to interact, will be at your fingertip. So this is the revolution we are going to. So 10,000 times is not a big deal because your health will be managed by the connectivity. Your commerce will be managed, personal commerce will be, or the purchase or selling or whatever it is. It will be managed by the the point-to-point the -point connectivity what we are going to achieve. And your social dealings will be managed by that. Everything will be dealt by the connectivity. So even 1,000 is may not be the right uh, magnitude for planning what we have to take. It requires invisible intelligent network and connectivity and that to working on demand, not all the time. I may require heavy connectivity at some time, otherwise I may not require even sufficient bandwidth, quality and security I require. So there is a 
a massive amount of structural transformation in intelligent domain required in the communication side. High bandwidth intelligent wireless communication, improved internet, self-identifying machines. How do, how do, what do we mean by self-identifying machines? Six billion machines, or say to say, yesterday I was reading actually, 1.3 billion mobile phones of 3G will be required in India by 2020. So the craze for catching with that, all the mobile companies are set on. So, and India may be having 1 billion people. And their calculation is that most of the people, that means 300 million people are going to have much more than one or two telephones. It is natural, I agree. But the point is that 6 billion people in the world and they want connectivity and they want the bandwidth. Who will give? Of course, there is a commerce and trade in that. Apart from that, the technology will drive such a way that they are going to get it. This is the way to grow. So, looking at with those uh, points in the mind, we require actually invisible intelligent network and high bandwidth wireless communication will be the solution. It will be so invisible, we take it, connect it and does it. But managing this has to be under autonomic or intelligent systems. And self-identifying machines, I happen to tell, it's difficult. You can go with IP version 6 to Terra levels of machines connected very easily, I agree. At the same time, electronic identification will be one of the redundant identification we want. I was actually talking to University of California, San Diego professors who are trying to put identification. So, will the computers be able to tell that I am sitting here in this room? Is there a chance for identifying the machines using the I property of it? Any thought process in any of the species or intelligent systems by which the thought itself is identified by the thought, it will be able to recognize itself. This is the property actually many of the species identified or in the evolution they got it and they became the better and then human being have got actually the best way of doing it. So self-identifying machines so that you know even if it is lost, even if the electronic connectivity is lost, it identifies itself and it comes back. The numbers are not the gain. The thought process it will identify itself or the intelligent process the machines have got in them, it will be able to identify the thought what it has got. So it's a, it's a loop by itself actually, it's a nested loop of thought process or the logic process what we have in the machine and then self-identifying machines will be distributed and it will be able to tell, I am working with Mr. Muhammad. It will be able to tell because it has got all the features to identify its not the IP address, the way in which we are doing today. It may have an IP address redundantly to have the electronic systems to smoothly conduct. So, work as server as well as the client. This is not a big deal. Today, many of our, our tablets are capable of working in a little primitive way as a server and as a client. But those systems will be working in an absolutely perfect way when we have got capability to manage the transport of the data from that in a critically, in a, in, a, in a controlled way. Maybe the tablets are the primitive forms of the upcoming era where it will work like so. That means along with me, I will have a digital system or a, or a digi clever. So the cleverness of that, it depends on the machine what I have. It will deal with all my stock deals. It will deal with all my business. It will deal with all my health problems and it will deal with anything, all my relationship across the world it will deal. So a part of my intellectual existence will be automatically transferred and it will be supporting me with security. This is what we are evolving to. We are looking forward to infusing intelligence into machines more and more for that purpose. So the endpoints to contain assistance for medical, financial, social, educational aspect, education, the main job what we are doing today, it will be transferred to the systems in such a way that when you want to learn, there's no time specific for you to learn anything in the world. You can learn whenever, wherever you are, at whichever age period you are. Only the angle of your thought need to be. Even that could be driven from the machines. So the machines becoming more and more intelligent will transform 
your existence us it has little transformed your existence using the modern tablets and the smart systems around you so they will have to be autonomic computing platforms self identifying self healing and auto reacting many of the things need to be in the cognitive domain and how come network handle all this more and more see the, the more and more transportation of data is required and the data need to be identified across 6 billion people and to to know about one person it's not a big deal because keeping a 6 billion database a database for 6 billion people it's nothing and i was speaking about 2 years back if you take one of the devices which are along with you and you sweep across it may contain about 50 sensors for the smartphones phone actually the communication part of this phone is only about 10 percent or 15 percent at that time it will contain that much of sensors by which your dna can be analyzed on this port and it will be connected to the six billion database and whole details about you will come for good purpose or bad purpose it is up to us to decide but the feasibility of realizing our existence on earth in a much more meaningful way is under evolution it is coming up so how come we handle all this more cognitive the machines which are getting connected and the communication system supporting the connectivity need to become more and more intelligent and the heavy work is going on how to put actually maybe the basics of genetic algorithms in finding out the hills and valleys of the network in front of us or maybe particle swarm optimizations or maybe a bacteria foraging algorithm which we'll look into so there are different types of making the graded networks actually when the network is actually like a blanket around the earth we know that you know which way the communication has to go today is actually a little bit intelligence not that so intelligent our routers and switches and all under our instruction is trying to hit several times and get to a click so that it can go so those things will be moving out and it will be controlled by cognitive routers and cognitive switches and cognitive trunking systems so that will try to understand the ambience in which the communication takes place today's communication systems are not intelligent to understand actually what's happening in the different parts of the world until and unless we infuse it to them many of the managers main job they get maybe ten thousand dollars per month it is because of that they know and the machines do not know so we would like to pay ten thousand dollars again but we would like to see that most of the work done by them is done by the machines in a short period of time maybe 10 years 20 years time so this is the revolution we are looking forward to and of course the most favorite thing for the industries and the business people the computer embedding we have been embedding actually computers from 1980s embedded computer system and uh, we have done wonders with that most of the industries have the best distributed computing systems by which maybe of the order of 10,000 processors will be working in a nuclear power plant from the smallest 8 bit to maybe 32 bit or 64 bit computers actually in the their supervisory controlled SCADA systems or maybe many of the other process control systems and then the total management systems but the point is there actually we have been creating such embedded systems which were all most of the time defined architectures and defined purposes every facet of life we are actually becoming better we require more intelligence machines learn what we do and later do what we did i hope you got the message of that sentence and we want to have systems in business by which the way in which i do the business i want to see that it is learned by my machine with enough security of course so and then later help me to do the work again in a much better way how to realize it there is a transition required from the 20th century perceptions towards the 21st century perception actually industry and business requires to be embedded with more computers so autonomic systems in business and industry is one of the need what we are projecting today so that the business process and the industrial process and various other interactive processes by which our economy stays, our production stays, or the, 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 um, the international relationship sustains, 
it will be actually supported by more and more intelligent embedding what we are trying to do into the systems. Implementation of autonomic systems and master systems that enable loss of autonomous operation in consultative paradigm with humans in the loop. We are not making a world where it is governed by the computers. All the things what we are talking for the 21st century, it's actually consultative paradigm where I will be the master and I will be aided by the additional intelligence I am trying to incorporate into computing nodes. And it will learn, it will keep knowledge with them and those knowledge will be kept in such a way that it is reconfigurable, upgradable and disposable under my command. So I can remove the knowledge, I can add the knowledge, but it's in a consultative paradigm. So enough engineering in hardware and software are required and uh, large scale sensor interfacing, you know that actually. The, the smartphones today, they have got at least four or five or 10 sensors. Actually, the two or three gyros, which will be rate sensors, and there are a few accelerometers by which you know, when you take like this, it changes things. Accelerometers are there, micro accelerometers, and rate gyros. I can put thermistors or thermal sensors. I can have actually uh, maybe pulse sensors, Many of the, many of the requirement of the health, I'm, I'm writing to Nokia these days, actually, you can incorporate into the, into the machines. So the machine can hold, that's what I said two years back, 50 sensors by which the DNA itself can be analyzed. So you can identify a species, what it is, by rubbing on it. I want only a tiny cell from it, which could be actually, I can sense what type of identity it has got. So there's no limit for using the sensors successfully in supporting the human life in a better way. So sensors interfacing the humans and systems will come more and more and system must learn their evolution to reduce the risk and the intelligence we want to build, the, the, the recognition capability and the processing capability will be nested by which what happened to the machine in the past it will know and it will be able to add and extrapolate the knowledge such a way that risk is minimized. Repetition of the fault again and again will be reduced. Optimize the energy. Today many of the systems are using the maximum energy it can have. But optimization of energy will be the need of the tomorrow and it will be taken care of by the systems. Increase the business returns. The way in which I do the business and how much optimization I can get for the best returns. Of course, returns will be getting balanced across the machines and across the people like it's happening today across the people. When you are doing the business one to another, there will be a balancing of the returns for each. So the edge is actually the maximum information and maximum response what you have. That will be aided by the embedded systems actually. Large systems require intelligent schedulers. This is one of the points. We have been actually putting scheduling systems into the, uh, the large scale systems using the embedded computers. We know that. But some of the off late incidents like Fukushima, Fukushima earthquake and the tsunami has made the, opened the eyes of the computer scientist which I have written to the 23rd uh, International Parallel and Distributed Computing uh, Conference recently and selected as the best and they wanted me to chair the conference. So the point in that is um, actually what I am telling is when the earthquake took place and the Fukushima was under trouble and all these SCADA systems actually, the embedded systems there, most of them were lamenting about the fixed scheduling systems which we were looking into. Many of the open doors and many of the unclosed valves which are actually, basically it is important in the right way of working. In the critically damaged, catastrophic damage to the plant was actually neglected the scenario of catastrophic damage when actually the, the core, nuclear core was actually burning down to burst. The lamenting of the computers were on the lights not getting switched off and the doors went in, going open and there were a lot of things which has been brought out. So we want super schedulers actually coming and overall scenario change in the systems. So more intelligence we want in the computers who are actually going to be embedded. Actually social systems governance and finance and the more and more computers embedding into the society, we would like to see that the finance is properly controlled. You can spend how much ever money you want. You can collect 
how much more money you want to create and then collect. You can do the business as you want. But we would like to, you to support, get the support from the banking systems and from the uh, governmental systems, such a way that much better economic status can be maintained by the nation by actually introducing more information systems with individuals and organizations and enterprises. It may be a negotiable point because of the uh, privacy excursions and intrusions it may make. Better stable socio-economic conditions by building more intelligence into the network, the computer systems, which will infuse into the society. Because legal, legal experts are talking to me that this is difficult in the near future. Okay, fine. Since we are talking much about the information management, I thought I will just look a little more closely over that rather than using the predictive scenarios of it. There are several issues actually remaining in the information management what we are doing. Many of the companies in the world, they are doing the information management more or less successfully. Until or unless a peril comes and the issue comes up, all the systems are good in the world. So for that environment, when we are looking into effective information management for 21st century, where it will contain. The point is that the information is getting more and more spread into more and more invisible domains. So calculating those invisible domains and accounting them and then putting into the management of the knowledge and information is one of the challenge. The, of course, the web content management, some part we are successful and the other part is actually the data analytics related to the business. <laughs> data analytics related to the, uh, the industry and the commerce and uh, definitely the production centers and uh, uh, the international trade. All these things are going to be web bound or the internet bound and then management of such things in the inner domain of the, uh, the industry and the outer domain of the industry. So there is a balancing and then management system to come up and then the document management. We may not be escaping from dealing with the documents and then registering things and then keeping the pile of our activity maybe inside the computer or maybe some more time with the paper. So document management and records management, many of the legal systems will be definitely insisting upon process and procedures to be made into records and then managing them explicitly, implicitly and in a correlated manner. And digital asset management, the more and more evolution takes place, the assets are becoming more digital. And more digital assessment management, we require more complex systems where we want to infuse more intelligence actually in this. And then learning management. So information comes up only through learning. One way information will invite you and the other way information will be actually called in. There are two aspects actually. In mute systems, most of the time, information will invite them. And the, what they get will be much minimal. But the companies and then more progressive society, it will try to infuse or take, take more knowledge from the environment. So there, the learning management is going to be one of the game. In which way, maximum amount of information per limited amount of time. How do we manage or how do we consume? And uh, what sort of content management we can do over the learning? And then the collaboration of entities. Actually, the entities exist in collaboration through the, the perceptions and then the cognitions what you have. And the exchange is really actually the knowledge what they, so if I know about another department of my company, it is known not only through the people, it is known through the activities and those, those uh, uh, assets or the operations what they have. That's what I learned and then put it. So how do I achieve the collaboration of entities and then how do I manage the information with that? All these things run with the critical items of involvement, people, the process of managing it, and the technology involved in managing it, and the content what we manage. So a total interaction of all these entities together will be making the modern information management systems, and we are on the way to look into that. And how do we, 21st century, how do we infuse better outlook into that? Building autonomic properties to knowledge. 
self routing self integration self disassociation self storage capability this may look into most of the time the biological influences what computer science is getting so most of the information to the, your brain is going in an auto routed way it will reach the destination where it properly it has to reach so it has got proper intelligence tagging most of the time so that will result in routing integration dissociation and self storage capabilities and key to this capability is the intelligent qualifier approach to knowledge bins they do integration differentiation addition and subtraction so knowledge to knowledge or the information to information it can integrate at any time information to information it can disintegrate and then it can manage ontology research has breakthroughs and it can create knowledge from information like in foliage i told you we are working i am personally working on with some postdocs they are working for me and we have a very good success in those domains and then further evolution we look towards actually interacting with the information will be more intelligent the perceptions of information by different people are different today the way in which i see the way in which other people see for the same objective or same information there will be a mismatch and whether computer can help it to homogenize it is required in the companies where the decision has to be homogenize how it can help us to understand the way in which five people understand the same thing in the right mode intelligent consultative paradigms they clear it in business built with analytics and inferences estimation of information with correlation to objectives and compatibilities also be incorporated too and then pervasive information and meta connectivity to pull out heap of knowledge when i get actually uh, suppose i get about an information about helicopter it's a word by itself if i pull out that i will be getting a heap of details about it the manufacturers or the engineering related to that the flight dynamics of it the landing capabilities of it the quality reliability risk factors like that the whole information comes out of it so and the pervasive information and the correct information below it when i pull out from google you know that how much redundant information and how much irrelevant information comes so i want really the good information management system to filter it properly intelligently what i intend give out from the pull out so this is one of the challenge we will be facing and we have solutions for that and then of course okay so of course the cloud computing is coming actually the cloud in the perception today actually it's a data center oriented activity and data centers are actually professing or rather making people to believe they are the cloud but be the computing scientist we are telling that you are not the cloud you are a part of the cloud we would like to see that actually fully ubiquitous computing available to any man at any part of the world at any time enough on demand computing is channeled from the cloud to that and then we have to have a pms metrics which i am trying to patent not at got actually processors p11 to pmn i will have the processors distributed i will have the memory distributed i will have the storage distributed freely across the world i will be able to pick up processor 1 there processor 127 there processor 238 from there and i will be able to couple it together i will be able to add memory together i will be able to collect from the freely independent storage media and then connect to that what does it call we call it as virtualization a virtual arbitrary system will be responding to me and my demands will be met with so the cloud computing is going to be the revolution and it has to go a little long way to reach the final one can i get a great computing as a service i must get it on my small device here so if this device is capable of getting the largest terabyte or or the terabyte support or a petaflop computing or the result only i am interested how big the computer is gone that is 20th century what i want is the amount of problem i am giving the amount of result what i am getting back and how how fast i can get how efficiently i can get so the point is very very clear to us the cloud computing has to be on demand computing it has to be ubiquitous and it cannot be a particular pattern today companies are trying to impose i am 
I'm opposing most of the time. The cloud is in its infancy, mainly as a data center transform. It may take a little more time to reach the ultimate levels. In the past, uneven access to computing was the drawback, I have told you. The software as a service and these things, you know, it's quite common, people are introducing. But all these things are part of the functions uh, the cloud can offer like web services, platform as a service, managed services, and service, the commercial platforms it can give, so that my whole trade can be managed within the cloud, or the whole thing I can store there, or I can do it as a development platform. But cloud of today cannot be supportive to all. I want the whole globe to be supported. We want a better engineering reaching towards us. Heavy work is going on. Give equal opportunity for everybody to access the computing and the transition to portable assistance to assist the submission and retrieval of jobs, results, continuous engagements, and virtual networks. I don't want to know the way in which I got the result. To that level, I want to be transparent. And then theory of cloud need to go high. This is what we discussed last week. And then global scheduling strategies on the PMS, that is processor, memory, storage, matrix, where the company does not have, actually, it can deposit as much hardware as possible. It can deposit as much software as possible, but cannot claim that my cloud is the only cloud. We want to merge the cloud together. And then we want super virtualization capability, virtual threads inside the virtual loops. A virtual loop you can make, virtualization, and inside the virtualization, I want to make further virtualization in that. Because the processors unutilized the portions, I want to thread in. So virtual threading is one of the things which we are working on, and a global architecture for the cloud free from specific product dependency. This is the point where computer scientists and the companies differ. They want to make money by telling this is my cloud. We want to say that your cloud is not there. There is only one cloud. You can deposit and you can retrieve it back. I fully support that. Absolutely. And uh, just two minutes more, with your permission. One minute. All right, this is the, uh, many of my works were tuned within these goals. They include video on demand papers, software engineering. You can see many of the things in the uh, Cornell University, Harvard, NASA, and Science, and then uh, Elsevier, Scopus, different, and DBLP Europe. So software engineering, defect management, extensive work done in, in my, we have given approval for putting Nair Suma metric actually, depth of inspection and inspection performance metric which is used by the, the industry. And then estimation of maintainability which will be used actually in the feedback system development. And then advanced networking, I have the patent in cognitive network and then embedding the cognition using the hidden Markov models and then uh, different types of sensor network and real-time routing protocols so that end-to-end -end, uh, real-time commitments are maintained. And the cloud computing PMS theory, processor, memory, storage, metrics theory. And then real-time systems scheduling and multi-cores. And in the brain models, this is a patent what I have, inform large, transforming information to knowledge systems. And information threading and knowledge transforms, structure parsing nodes and intelligent links, and then bioinformatics I am spending because many of the things I feel we are going to learn heavily from biology. We spent two years, two years actually, for getting the biology into my head. And then digital image signal processing I am engaged in, adaptive wavelet transform for the ECG, EEG, so that you know complex arrhythmia and other things I will be able to uh, detect using that. And uh, cell transformation studies are going on by which from a 2D image itself, I will be able to identify most of the diseases actually percolating into the lower domain of the world, actually. Lower income people, because we don't want to give a very sophisticated uh, 250 Tesla uh, MRI by taking this. Every, every image contains information. The ability with the human being is only to retrieve and interpret it. And when an X-ray image is there, one doctor will be able to interpret little, the other doctor much more. So I want to see that computers and the modern computing techniques are able to detect the cell transformation. We are working on a global basis in uh, Bangalore and uh, we are getting uh, 
some sort of promise in your sons. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Nair, for, um, uh, wow, this is quite a, an enlightening uh, discussion that you've given us in terms of what's going on with technology, and uh, uh, we just have a few minutes here, and I'm wondering if anyone has any questions that you would like to ask uh, Dr. Nair. Yes, okay. So my question was this. Um, that uh, you compared the software development with pyramid building, with pyramid development, but software is different, right? Because software requires a lot of changes. It's like, if you compare it with pyramid, it would be like changing the pyramid structure or the things inside pyramid very frequently. Okay, so let me just. So my question was that uh, you said, you compared the software development you compare the software development with the pyramid development, right? So uh, development. how do we compare the software development with pyramid when the software is a very complex entity? It, like software can change, the requirements for software can change pretty quickly, while for pyramid, they are pretty much the same. So how, how do we uh, compare these two activities? that means, you know, are you talking about uh, the requirements? Software itself is a complex thing, and the requirements can tend to change, right? Is that the question? Well, that, that's what exactly the, the, the point what we are telling. The elicitation of the requirements and encoding that requirements into the computer, it's a, there's a big gap in it. So we would like to see that the cognitive systems are able to list the requirements in a meta domain of knowledge. And from that knowledge, it gets translated to the design. So we have not achieved it, but we should be able to. So that will solve the gap between the understanding of the requirements to the design. But in the design mode, we have very good achievements now, which may come in books and other things maybe after five years. But there are good papers available over it. We are able to measure the quality of the design. The computer, when you are designing, the computer will be able to tell its maintainability is this much, its defect proneness is this much. So if I have set goals for very good maintainability, I can restructure the whole design such a way that it reaches that. So it is called actually a feedback consultative paradigm by which it goes. So it should be possible over a period of time. Thank you, Dr. Nair. Do we have another question? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nair, uh, Thank you very much. for this uh, presentation. It was uh, very insightful. Um, uh, in the development, technology development, more slow still holds for the microprocessor power and for the memory with having more transistors fit in a single chip. In the application side and from connectivity, we still not the same or we don't have the same development speed or uh, uh, same level of development as in the processor power. Do you think we will ever get into a state where we will have the same with the, uh, the intelligence you put in the computing power or the applications development as well as the connectivity? Well, also, uh, my second question, do you think we'll ever get to a six billion connected people in the world? And how long <laughs> it will take us to do that? Well, the first part of it, actually, the computing power goes on and on. And are we able to manage those resources successfully in the applications? Well, there is a hitch in it, actually. When we made, actually, the multi-core systems by putting multiple CPUs on one wafer. Even the Intel uh, engineering vice president uh, at that time we were interacting with, he happened to tell we are not sure how it will be made use of. Because the games of dealing with parallel systems are not yet through. I cannot take a sample problem and then perfectly parallelize it and put it 
today it's not possible. So making multiple systems is one of the solutions where we have a predefined strategy for the application to be distributed and then made to be computing. But if it is an existing one where we never had a thought, it requires a full load of work to see that it goes into the computing power properly. So it remains to be a challenge and will remain to be a challenge until we get actually functional parallelism or FPUs actually, functional processing unit and functional processing firms, FPF, where we may try to put more biological inspirations into that. And the second part of it, six billion people, it's my wish too, and I'm not sure at what time it will be realized, but the whole world will be evolving towards it because it's a big market. It's a big market, and when the, when the evolution takes place in 20th century, I'm sure that those parts of the world, which may be some part in uh, Asian side, some part in African side, maybe in South American side, where these things have not reached, it will be possible for us to make it to reach and support them in their living. So six billion people end-to-end -end connectivity in uh, factorial format and the network getting successfully managed. It is one of the best wish and then we want to infuse more intelligence to manage it. Thank you very much. My question is how, where nanotechnologies plays in your research from the perspective if you want to have more intelligence in the processor and the hardware. Is, uh, do you have any work related to that from the perspective of nanotechnology and how it would be applied within that, uh, th this field? Nanotechnology. Well, nanotechnology is going to be the face set of 21st century. There's no doubt about it. As far as computing field is concerned, as far as computing field is concerned, uh, absolutely, uh, we, we, will, we are now operating very close to nanotechnology of the order of 28 nanometers fabrication is going on, and uh, 23 has been already tested. Further below when it goes, actually the dimension of an atom is of the order of one nanometer. And then multiple chains, when a molecule is getting formed, it comes to about seven nanometers, eight, and then macromolecules up to 16 and up to 23. When it comes to the silicon fabrication models, the, uh, the type of phenomenon what we see, if we are crossing below 20, the phonon noise is so much high, we are not able to extract the signals properly. So if you want to create 1 billion by packing at a lower level, that's the advantage we get. So there is a, there's an advantage and disadvantage cutting point somewhere. So it is yet under investigation and we, we will be. Definitely we are going to operate around 25 nanometers, that, that's very sure, as far as fabrication is concerned. But apart from that, nanotechnology has to offer very great things, actually in the memory designs and in the storage designs. A full infusion of nanotechnology properties, nano property, nanoparticle properties has not been yet given to the large storage devices. So the storage device, what you have, maybe a terabyte in your hand, will become actually a petabyte if proper nanotechnology is going to be applied soon. And it's not far away. It is actually over a period of five years. That's what computer technology will get from nanotechnology. Hi, Dr. Mir. Um, the human nature is quite different from machines. You have <coughs> emotions involved. Uh, humans are unpredictable. The same person could react to the same event differently depending on probably mode or if he's feeling sick or whatever. So uh, how can you rely on, uh, I guess, extrapolating human behavior or functional uh, knowledge units and translate those into machines? And, and also on the, on the same line, uh, human human thinking is, uh, is uh, quite difficult to, to predict and therefore the development of systems is probably not going to, to be able to go uh, too far. Yes, absolutely mean? correct actually. Human beings have got emotions and human beings have got desires 
and most of the time the performance of the human being is actually driven by these fundamentals. But today the psychology and the psychiatry has improved to that extent. We are able to quantitatively measure the emotional drive and uh, the desire drive by which people are getting motivated and dismotivated and things like that. But we are looking into the property of the mind by which the perception is carried out, whether it is because of desire or because of the emotion. When I am getting emotionally attached towards a technology, I spend a lot of time and learn it. But that emotion, we are trying to cut it off, but we are trying to capture the cognitive abilities of the mind when it is fully driven and those properties, how we can infuse into the machines. Of course, that's why I repeatedly told the human being is going to be the master and all the things what we are going to develop, it's going to be in the consultative paradigm. So you will interact with that, you can switch it off, switch it on, you can approve, disapprove. So we will never override in the coming few decades at least the machine taking over the will and wish and the emotions of the human being. But there is a good chance that when the best machines are coming and the best models are available, our emotions and our desires are going to be supported by the machines. It's not far off. Assalamu alaikum, uh, I have a question here, please. Uh, I read an article uh, that was written by um, one of the professors to uh, utilize the machines, the PCs, uh, on, at night, the power of the machines. So during the daytime, for example, when, when, when everybody's using them, there's a high demand to use these machines. But at night, when everybody go home, these machines are not utilized. And the study was is that all these connected PCs, I mean, look at, for example, Aramco, we have more than 50,000 uh, PCs at, at night, you know, just sitting idle. Um, but actually, I have not seen this being utilized by any other company. I don't know in the Europe, in the US, or of course in here. Uh, do, do you know there is a reason why this uh, cannot be utilized and using the, yeah. these powers uh, and connected PCs? Well, yes. Yes. I, I, in fact, the, when the more and more percolation of the systems, especially intelligent systems, comes in, one of the factors will be how far it is getting utilized. Of course, as far as, as, far as PC is concerned, as far as PC is concerned, I am writing at the middle of the one of the uh, uh, research paper that uh, the end of PC. Even though companies are not agreeing, we are convinced that the PC era is over. It's an antique now. But we will take uh, the question in a, in a different general mode that, okay, the computing machines, how far they can be used and how maximized use is possible when the pervasive network is going to come and each machine is going to be identified in the network and we have the energy conservation limit achieved by this machine. It can be 24 hours or it can be 12 hours kept on and the machine will arbitrate between the demand of the outside and demand of the interior domains within the company or outside the company within the limits of security and uh, the um, advanced uh, uh, walling, what we can do actually, or the, uh, the blockades, what we can do for our information. So the machine will be able to arbitrate between the, the interior core and the external facilities it can offer. So the future machines, which are allowed to do external support, it will actually schedule itself and will pave the way for adding values to the network. It is possible, and there is a thought process in that line. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Um, looking at our time here, we need to have a little break because.